Hello, Brave Nation, and welcome to episode 27 of Brave Hawk Talk, presented by Pepsi. Pepsi, that's what I like. I'm John Gross, and as the holiday season gears up, so does the need for great food. And if you're anything like me, you'll want something that's healthy, but it's also filling. So why not stop by Jersey Mike's of Pembroke? High quality subs for any occasion. Jersey Mike's of Pembroke, a sub above. Today we are joined by Zion Sellers of the UNCP soccer team and assistant AD for athletic performance, Josh Gooding. First up, Zion Sellers was a standout freshman of the pitch last season and played a key role in the Braves' fourth NCAA tourney appearance. But did you know she's also a globetrotting photographer? Here's this week's Scotland Health Student Athlete of the Week, sophomore Zion Sellers. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm really uh, looking forward to chatting with you today. Can you take us through what this offseason has been like for you and your teammates? Uh, offseason has been really weird. I know generally a couple of us stay in our apartment and we get together to train, but due to COVID, a lot of us kind of just went home because we weren't able to train in our groups anymore. And we just figured it'd be better if we went home and just kind of did our own training. So because of that, I've been forced to kind of like train by myself, which is really weird for me because <laughs> I feel like I like to train more with groups because it motivates more. It motivates me more and pushes me a little bit more as well. And so training by myself, like in this cold, thank you, COVID, it's just like not as fun, I guess, but it definitely makes me work a little bit harder just because I know that I have other teammates who are doing the same thing so we can have a good season coming up. What does that look like, training by yourself? What, what are you able to do? Um, so I generally start with a gym workout. I have, like, a weights at home, so I go out in my garage and I get a lift in. I generally do legs and core, and then I do some type of running. So sometimes if it's, like, cold and rainy, I'll go on the treadmill and I'll do like a sprint treadmill workout, which is so hard. And then I'll, if it's like nice outside, but it's just a little cold, I'll go outside and I'll run like two to three miles. And then at the end of the day, closer to probably like four or 5 p.m., I go to the soccer field just so I can get some touches on the ball so like my touch doesn't look terrible when I get back to school. And so I'll do like um, shooting, long balls, I'll practice free kicks, and then I'll do some, like, technical drills just to work on 1v1s and, like, moves and that kind of thing. I have to say, I, I'm tired just listening to that. That's <laughs> that, that's a very impressive workout regimen you have. Yeah. I, I think it, for me, I don't – I feel like it's harder for me to work out in the cold and play in the cold, so I'm trying to, like, kind of – do a little bit more just because you know like when it's cold it's harder to breathe mm. and so I feel like I have to almost work harder during this off season so that I can get ready and be prepared to play at like 110% doing those February games right your season starting in February which is different I mean I remember last year there was the uh, the Peach Belt Conference tournament game that was cold but I mean, a February start will will definitely be chilly. But uh, looking back to last season, it was your freshman year here at UNCP, and you put together a, a stellar campaign. Two goals, you had 12 starts. Uh, what, what was uh, your experience like last year in your first season playing at the Black and Gold? It's crazy because, like, going into my freshman year, I kind of was just like, I want to get on the field. And I was like, I didn't care how long I got on the field or how long it would, like, how long I played and so going forward that was kind of my goal and it wasn't as high as I wanted it to be but I just really wanted to play and so I remember it was uh the Lenore Ryan that was like my first goal and I remember I didn't start that game and Lars I was like oh, why didn't I start but Lars and Padilla they decided to put me in and I went in and I was just like okay like I gotta I gotta show them that I deserve to start and so from then on, it just kind of clicked as soon as I stepped on the field. And I was like, okay, this is it. And so I just got real excited and I had a good game. And then going forward, I started playing a little bit more. I started starting games too. And so it definitely like boosted my confidence a little bit. And so then I was able to develop into a 
better player, I think, because of that. Do you remember, like, can you take us step by step through your first career goal? Because I'd imagine that's a pretty memorable milestone for you. Yeah, for sure. So I went in and I was playing forward at the time. And I remember Morgan is actually my roommate. And so we're really close. And it's crazy because I played club with Naomi and Morgan played with Kennedy. And we played against each other a bunch of times, but we just never knew each other. And so when we got to Pembroke, we would train on our own together. And we kind of practiced that play before it happened in practice. And so as soon as I get in the game, Morgan gets the ball and I make this run across um, – like across their center backs, and Morgan plays the ball perfectly. And then I just kind of shoot it, and it goes in. And I just remember being so excited. I was just like, oh, my God, did I just score? And so <laughs> after that, Morgan came, and she's like, cheer me on. And then I see, like, my uh, other roommates, they're like, oh, my God, you scored, you know. And the team is, like, hyping me up because it's my first goal. And, like, as a freshman, you know, you just – you've never expected something like that to happen to you like playing club you score but I don't it's not as big of a deal as like scoring your first goal in college right so it's just like a big moment for me I can imagine I'm sure that's something that you will remember for a long time and you touched a little bit on your soccer past your time before UNCP uh, but going even further back than that when did you start playing soccer playing soccer I would say kind of late like I didn't take it seriously until I got older I played rec like at eight and I never took soccer seriously just because I did so many other things and I still did a bunch of other things in high school but going into middle school I moved actually to North Carolina and so that was like when I started kind of playing club and I got a little bit more into it and I was like maybe I could go to college for this but I wasn't quite sure and then high school came And that, for me, like my eighth grade year, I was really getting into the arts. So, like, I like to do musical theater and play piano. So I decided to go to Northwest, which is an art school um, in Charlotte area, North Carolina. And when I was there, I remember being like, okay, I'm not going to be able to do soccer and the arts. Like, it's just too time-consuming. And I, like, wasn't able to put my energy into both at the same time. And so I think I, I met Lars. And I went on a couple of visits to some other schools. And I remember coming to Pembroke, and I was like, I like the small town. I like the country vibes it was giving me. <laughs> and so that's kind of where it started for me. And I was like, okay, maybe I can do, like, college and soccer. And so I kind of just put the arts on, like, the back burner. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go full-on soccer mode for college. And so that's kind of how I got where I am. Wow, well, well, that's incredible, and I know you mentioned you were involved in a lot beyond soccer. I know that you still are, though, to a degree. I know that you're really big into photography, for example. When, when did that passion start? That was at art school. Um, I had I got a camera for Christmas, and I kind of was like, okay, like I don't really know how to use it, but I'm going to start. And so I had friends who needed action shots because, you know, most of them were going on, like, um, to audition for shows and stuff, so they needed action shots. So I was like, okay, uh, they need the headshots, not action shots. And so when I were taking their action, their headshots, um, I just kind of got better, and I was like, I think I could do this. And then I was like, okay, this is kind of boring. Like, let me try a different type of photography. So then I went to my brother's DA game, and I took action shots for the first time. And I realized that, like, I love that more than anything. So I started taking action shots, and I've been taking them probably for about four or five years. What is it? Like on the side. What is it about taking action shots and, and I guess, photography in general that, that you like so much? I like being able to capture the memories, like, of scoring goals. Like, that's my favorite thing is seeing the people celebrate, and then you can see – because you see the person that scored the goal, and then you also can see in the background, like, how the team reacts or how the parent reacts. And so that was – that for me was, like, I'm able to capture this for someone else so that they can always look back and remember this joy that they had on their face, or they can remember this moment, or their parents can remember, like – wow, I remember this goal vividly type of deal. So it's just like a big passion of mine, honestly. 
Do you have a favorite photograph that you've ever taken? Um, yeah, so my brother's keeper, his name is Lucas, and phenomenal keeper, probably one of the best, like, men's keeper I've ever seen. Um, there's a picture of him saving this goal, and I've never seen, like, a goalie jump this high, like, in the air to save a goal. And I still have it, I think. Um, but he saved this incredible goal that this guy was shooting, and he blocked it, of course, but it's probably one of the coolest pictures I've ever taken by far. Awesome. Now, I know beyond even photography, uh, I know that you've taken some very memorable trips. Uh, I know South Africa, for one. Can you talk a little bit about that? What, what, Where have you traveled, and, and what have you done in those trips? So, growing up, um, my dad and my mom wanted to get us exposed to more cultures, so I've been traveling since, like, a young age. Um, my first trip was to Jamaica. That was a family trip. Then I went to London and Paris. I didn't like Paris as much as I thought I would, though, but I loved London. I've been to other places in Europe, and like you said, I just got back um, from South Africa, and then for Thanksgiving, I went to the Dominican Republic. But South Africa was my favorite trip, and it was weird because growing up, like, you see Africa as if it's this poor country, you know, like dirt roads, um, it smells bad, you just think it's poor. But when I went, it was just like a very eye-opening experience because, yes, it's poor, but it's also like very nice. Like they have cities just like we do here. It's just that this, the disparation of wealth is a lot greater. So you can walk across the street and you can see like this town we went, it was called Alex. And um, it was very poor. They didn't have irrigation. And... But across the street, you would see, like, these mansions. And so it's kind of weird. And it's also – so when I was there, we saw, um, like, nice cars. And to me, that was weird. And so I asked our tour guide because he lived in the Alex community. And we had gone over to, like, give them toys and stuff and just kind of hang out with the kids there at an orphanage in the community. So I was like, how come people have nice cars but they live in situations like this? And he was like, in Africa – your image is everything. So he's like, when people go out, they don't want to, they don't want other people to know that they live in a community like Alex. So they drive these fancy cars so that people will think of them as these wealthy Africans. And that for me, it was just like, wow, I never realized like how materialistic we were until I went there. And then it kind of made me like take a step back and reflect and realize how materialistic I was. So it was just a very eye-opening experience, and it was just so pretty. Like, the water was gorgeous. The mountain views were amazing, too. That's definitely my favorite trip. Yeah, that, that that's a very interesting thing because I'm kind of from the same boat. My parents felt that same way. We've done a lot of traveling, too, and I know it's changed my life. You know, For you, how is, how is traveling around the world and seeing all these different places and peoples, how has that changed your perspective on life? It just, every time I go, it just makes me more grateful um, to be able to do this with, like, the people that I'm able to go with. For example, my family. Like, a lot of families I know don't travel for Thanksgiving or rent out houses, but, like, we're able to do that, and my family is able to go and experience other cultures, and it just makes you have, like, a greater appreciation of your life and the things that you're able to do or the people that you're able to impact or help along the way. Um, I remember when I stayed in South Africa, we had this girl, she like worked at the hotel and she was just kind of like, yeah, like I'm in school and I, I work, so I don't really have time to go out. And so I was like, you're 20, like you've never been out before. And she was like, it's kind of hard, you know, because school is expensive down there for them. And she's like, she has to work to pay for school. So she doesn't have time to go out. So I remember, like, one day we were like, okay, we're going to take you shopping. So we bought her this nice outfit, and then we took her out to, like, eat a nice dinner, and we went out and had fun. And just the joy on her face, because you could tell she had never had that type of experience before where someone just kind of 
comes up and is like, let's go shopping or let's hang out, you know. And we got to know each other. She talked about her a little bit about her home life. And you just kind of compare them, like, living in South Africa. Well, she didn't live in South Africa. She lived in Johannesburg. But living there is completely different than living in Charlotte. And so it just makes you really appreciate the little things in life. Wow. Very well put. Very well put. I uh, want to end with a question that will make you think a bit. Like you just said, you are a big traveler. Your family, a bunch of big travelers. Is there one place, or you could list a couple, I guess, but that you have not been that you were just dying to go to one day? Okay, this is going to be really weird, but I want to go to Antarctica just because <sighs> I want to travel to every, like, seven continents before I graduate. And I feel like that is by far probably the hardest one because I'm not a big fan of the cold, but I've heard that it's beautiful. And so I feel like I have to go before I graduate. And so if that's a place I could pick, because my family probably would not come with me on that trip, I would definitely say Antarctica. So is that the only continent that you're missing? No, I'm missing Asia and South America as well. One day, you'll hit all seven, and if you get to Antarctica, I mean, I, that's that just sounds like an amazing trip. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, this has been great, and uh, we're really looking forward to, uh, to your season in February. Thank you. Thanks again to Zion, and we're excited to watch your sophomore campaign this spring. Do you like wings? Well, I like wings, and if you do too, the Wing Company Bar & Grill of Pembroke must be on your list. Using only the freshest ingredients, Wing Co. provides classic staples such as award-winning wings, burgers, and sandwiches for the whole family. The Wing Company Bar & Grill of Pembroke, now available for online ordering. For college athletes, there is no off-season. Workouts and nutrition plans provide the key ingredients to success, and those things never stop. Here at UNCP, we're fortunate to have one of our own leading the charge of fitness for a competitive edge. And even if you're not an athlete, you'll benefit from this discussion too. Here's Assistant AD for Athletic Performance, Joshua Gooding. You are the Assistant AD for Athletic Performance. That's a pretty simple name for what your job actually entails. So what exactly uh, do you do here at UNCP? Um, we oversee and implement all the strength and conditioning aspects for uh, our 13 teams here. So anything from, you know, your flexibility, mobility, um, to your functional training, sport specificity, um, you know, we operate through all of those realms, and then we try to uh, give our athletes the best footing within, you know, um, <clears throat> giving them nutritional tips as well as, you know, some, some things that they can implement within their uh, – their own kind of home lifestyles to uh, make their athletic pursuits a little bit more successful. And obviously uh, your role is, is, is incredibly important, and, and we've seen that across the country, whether it's through nutrition or, or expanded uh, workout programs. You know, how do you feel that, that your role has a direct impact on uh, performance in games for UNCP athletes? <clears throat> um. I feel like it uh, it has a direct effect, especially in the avenues in which we uh, we try to utilize it and um, and apply it for our athletes. So you know, our overall goal here is you know to increase their athletic performance, um, and we try to do that more so through functional training and sports specificity, in the sense of <clears throat> teaching them and refining them, refining the things that they're going to be doing on the. Uh, highest frequency so all in all you know we're going to try to make sure uh, football players can tackle and be durable within within that and also you know receive it same thing you know um we want to make sure uh our volleyball players have a really strong shoulder cuff and you know everything within that is going to be well supported and stable enough for them to uh you know um continue spiking the ball and continue to, you know, have that, those uh, upper extremity stress without uh, hopefully leading to um, injury. I think I've asked this question to everyone that I've had on the podcast over these last few months because this pandemic has impacted everyone and their jobs differently. So how has COVID uh, changed your role at UNCP? Uh, I would say 
with me specifically, it's helped me refine my verbiage and my cues for athletes to where they can hopefully pick up off of what I'm saying. Um, and a lot of times when it comes down to movement, it's really hard to articulate because you're trying to sometimes get athletes to, you know, activate musculature that they haven't before or at least not in that fashion or trying to get them into different positions in which they're not normally in and, um, and allowing their muscles to activate from those positions. So just trying to teach those things verbally. So I've been um, working on my communication a lot more, uh, and I feel like uh, that's been one of the biggest changes for me as a coach um, because <clears throat> you're not able to be as hands-on and, and help kind of move them into position with, you know, trying to maintain the six feet and some of our COVID protocol that we have here placed in, at the university. So I feel like for me that has been the biggest change. Um, operationally, I would say the biggest change has been um, the uh, – our reduced capacity. Normally, you know, we can just about pack a weight room out. Uh, we have two facilities here at the university, and I would say our smallest facility operating-wise was probably about, functionally, I would probably say about 30, but, you know, within, you know, being creative, you can probably get that number up to around 35, 40 uh, athletes, you know, everybody working efficiently in the space now. Um, with COVID protocol, we have had to reduce that number to our smallest weight room to uh, 15 uh, working persons at one time. So that, I would say, operationally has been the biggest adaptation for us. And what what has your solution been to that issue with uh, just having 15 people in, in one room? That's it. <clears throat> um, I would say we just have to be uh, strict toward our times and, and where we would uh, – normally have you know a 30 minutes between um lifts and where we could kind of trickle over if need be um we are not allowed uh you know that flexibility now within the schedule being that um we have to train you know for example our football team we're between four and six uh <clears throat> lifting sessions because their numbers are so high so like I said, we just have to make sure that, you know, we're strict on time. Our plan is <clears throat> thorough, and it has everything included. And sometimes, you know, you have to be flexible to say, hey, well, we have to deviate from the plan, you know, in order to uh, stay strict within those time parameters. But uh, I would say that's been the biggest thing in, our, you know, just just scheduling and everybody being adaptable has been the biggest solution to that problem. Now, I know workouts differ from a team that's in season versus out of season. And, and given that some of these fall seasons are now in the spring and, and things are moved around and games are canceled and, and whatnot, how, has, how has, has that changed your workout plan with these teams? Given that, you know, for football, for example, they're normally getting prepped for the fall and then they're in season. Now they're not playing till the spring. Correct. Um, so... Well, that is a good question. It's actually been a little bit, uh, say, what a best of both worlds as much as we can. Um, and the other thing about it is uh, it's some parts of COVID in itself has had to change our, um, our approach to it with um, <clears throat> there being a reduced accessibility to, you know, um, athletic environments. And even the weight room, uh, we've had to take a slower approach uh, to make sure, you know, we have a proper progression for our athletes, getting them acclimated back into, you know, the sporting environment. And same thing, getting their, you know, <clears throat> getting their minds acclimated to it. And that's a, that's a big portion, I feel like, within strength conditioning uh, that is uh, not really looked on is the uh, psychological aspect in which, uh, you know, you're trying to prep and prepare our athletes' minds. Um, not not just their bodies, but their minds, <clears throat> you know, for all this activity, for the amount of, you know, stress, the amount of fatigue that's going to be placed on them and keeping them in a, you know, a good, good mental state in order to keep up and be successful within some of the endeavors in which we're going to place on them. I feel like that's uh, one of the biggest things and, you know, on top of COVID and on top of, you know, a, a ton of uncertainty, I feel like that's been one of, the, the bigger aspects we've um, had to maintain um, amongst, you know, 
everything else that's going on. I want to dive a bit into your past because you are a UNCP alum. You had a standout career on the gridiron for the Braves, uh, which included a trip to the uh, to the playoffs. But when you look back yeah. at your time as a student athlete at UNCP, what comes to mind? Ooh, a ton, a ton. Um, uh, let's see. I've I've been in Pembroke and been a brave since about 2009 um it's uh <clears throat> honestly it, there are a couple people that helped me get here and uh, it's hard for me to envision my uh my participation as a brave without them because i wouldn't be here without them but uh as far as an athlete i mean it was it's it's littered with good times it's littered with a lot of hard work um I'm very happy I came to Pembroke because it's a small knit uh, university. It gives you an opportunity to really dive um, into, you know, those things which you find important. Um, and especially as an athlete, you know, my athletics was important, my academics was important, and I feel like with you know uni- uh, UNC Pembroke being, like I said, that small knit environment, it gave me an opportunity to really focus on those. And and I feel like that's what was a big key within me being successful in my athletic career. And that was a big key within that, navigating me toward, you know, kind of uh, um, being a strength coach and, and wanting to pursue that and wanting to better our athletes and, and help their pursuits of being being successful. So I feel like um, within within Pembroke, um, it was just always just a just the atmosphere, just a just a really productive. Um, and fruitful atmosphere in which I feel like I could uh, take advantage of, and I feel like I did. And h- how do you feel that your experience as a student athlete, and in particular as a student athlete at UNCP, has helped you uh, in in your role now back at UNCP in charge of the strength program? Um, I feel like I I have a I have a unique experience for the things that go into. Um, college athletics, and I say unique because I had a, I experienced it here, and the fact that you know um, it's a lot more specific than your average coach is going to get here. A lot of the times within you know um, athletics, especially at the university, you know, uh, there's a ton of turnover between coaches. And one great thing is you know within our university, we've you know <clears throat> been reluctant to have so as much turnover. And, you know, that's just a testament to, you know, our athletics in, in a whole. But uh, I feel like um, that was one big thing that I felt like I'd be able to bring to the athletes and, like I said, help them out with that psychological aspect of it. Um, it's not all about, like I said, just weights, weights and X's and O's. A lot of times it's, it's about the confidence and the morale that you have going into that, you know, that that pursuit in order to deem whether or not you're going to be successful. And I felt like that's a lot of the understanding that one, I had for the environment and two, I have for the sporting world in which I was going to be able to um, disseminate amongst our athletes. And that's where I say, I feel like my, my unique experience um, really, really gives me an, an edge, especially when it comes to UNC Pembroke. I know from, from 2014 to 2017, you had worked at UNCP previously in a similar role to what you have now. And then you took some time away from UNCP and you worked uh, in the private sector for 17 months at a couple of gyms. How did that experience help you? Um, I would say overall, uh, it, it, it gave me the, the opportunity to work on uh, my management skills within having to manage uh, – people more so than anything else in the sense of employees and the sense of people who don't necessarily have that um that work ethic already established um in them through athletics and that's one thing that you will find within <clears throat> within athletics is that you know a, a lot of coaches already have you know uh, that discipline and in that sense of work ethic already established through their pursuits of athletics. So when it comes to the general public, um, 
some of them didn't have that sense of work ethic because some of them had never sensed adversity. So they, one, didn't know how to cope with adversity. And then, two, when it was displayed, you know, they could not receive it constructively even if it was. If anything was provided to them negative, then it was perceived completely negative and and destructive. So at that point, it was hard to sometimes convey topics or sometimes bring up things for them without it being misconstrued, even if it was constructive. So, um, so that's one thing that I noticed that uh, just trying to <laughs> just trying to get jobs done, trying to get things done, it was just less efficient. Um, and not to say anything against you know the general public and i'm not making any uh, generalizations but uh i just noticed within my within my employees and the people that uh were already on our staff it was just hard to to get them and motivate them toward uh pursuing things or i wouldn't say hard but it was harder um it was more difficult than uh you would find that amongst uh well that i found amongst the athletes um and then the other section was that uh, within the um, the personal training side, uh, you again, you know, you still don't get the work ethic. You still don't have the uh, the motivation to change um, because it's not as important to uh, people who, well, the the general person that comes in, and that's why you see a lot of people kind of fall off from diets, fall off from you know their exercise routine because. When it comes down to it, they're, you know, extrinsically motivated, which means, you know, a lot of times with motivation, your extrinsic factors are going to be the ones to first depreciate and, you know, a motivate somebody um, to pursue, you know, whatever whatever they're looking at. And that's one thing that you would find amongst, you know, um, the pursuits of exercise amongst people in the general public, whereas you look at athletes, athletes are going to have, a little bit more motivation. One because you know some of their athletic pursuits within college are fleeting, and you, and you only have you know you have an expiration date on your athletic career for some athletes. Um, you can work out every day of your life if you choose to. So just that, just that factor in it, I feel like you know motivates athletes a little bit more um, than your general public to pursue some of the things that are necessarily. <clears throat> That's very interesting, and that's a really good segue into what I want to talk about next. And and in this COVID era, and really in general, like you said, it's tough for people who are not athletes to stay motivated and to stay in shape and to stay on the right track. Yeah. So, what what would your message be to people who are not athletes, but um, in in this tough time, and people are at home right now, and and maybe not as as locked in as as they'd like to be? What what would your message be to those people uh, for them to stay on track? It's um, one of my favorite quotes. We often overestimate what we can do in a day, and we often underestimate what we can do in a lifetime by John Maxwell. Um, just overall meaning that within those pursuits of exercise or, into, you know, <clears throat> or of activity, we want to make sure that it can be consistent, and that's the, that's the biggest thing. Um, if we can't maintain consistency within it, then that's when we start to become demotivated. And that's when we don't start to see those results in which, you know, we're looking for to validate um, some of our experience. And if we don't see those from a lack of consistency, then that also deters us from doing it. So those are some factors and those are some things that I really look at once it comes to, you know, being active. I want to do things in which I can maintain consistency. So one, you know, one of my greatest tips is, you know, you want, you want to start as a turtle versus a hare. So if you're looking to get active, then start slowly. I would say go on a walk every day, go on a 30 minute walk every day. And then that would cover, you know, your, uh, your mandates from the CDC for activity. Then from there, we can, you know, progress into adding in maybe some resistance training. The idea and the key is you do not want to start too fast or else, you know, you'll start to veer off of that path because then, oh, well, I need to take a day off because I'm too sore. 
you know, if we take that slow progression, then you'll be closer to the goal of being having consistent exercise. It's not, oh, I want a really high intense workout. You just need to make consistency first. Um, that would be the biggest thing I would say. And then also, you know, um, if you are a little bit more sedentary in, in your lifestyle right now, which, you know, the average person is, we also have to understand that, you know, our consumption has to mirror that. So <clears throat> one trick I have for myself is that, you know, if I'm more sedentary throughout the day, then when I'm feeling hungry, I'm really trying to consume more liquids water um and the reason for that is that our body our body tricks us sometimes or we allow it to trick us um our hunger sensation is the same sensation we feel for thirst hmm. so that point um we're thinking oh man i'm hungry i'm hungry again even though i just ate you know an hour and a half ago i'm hungry again well you're probably actually thirsty and you'll actually find that if you drink, you know, drink a mouthful of water, sometimes I really need a really big gulp, but <clears throat> you'll find yourself that, man, five five minutes later, I'm no longer hungry. Now, if you do that and 10 minutes later, you, you feel that sensation again, then yeah, you're probably hungry. But majority of the time that we misassociate that feeling. So, a lot of times we have that feeling to consume all day. Oh man, I've been sitting at, sitting at home all day and I've just been eating and eating and eating. Oh, that's probably because you actually haven't been consuming your, your right amount of fluids to keep you going. And a lot of times when we're um, more active throughout the day, we consume more fluids simply because we don't have the time to satisfy that, that sensation of hunger throughout our active day because I'm active. I don't have time to stop and eat all day. But if I'm at home and I'm sedentary and I have access to to food and, you know, these other these other calories, then I'm going to be bringing those in if I'm misassociating that cessation. So then that's when I say, oh, all right, well, let me start to consume more water. Boom. That's going to help with that. That's going to help with that. And then then from there, I mean, like I said, if we add in the activity, you worry about the hydration. I'm not, I'm not really big on calorie counting because it, t it takes a ton of maintenance. And for the average person, that's, that's not maintenance. That, that is a necessity. Um, I would say, like I say, consume your water, you exercise. Then from there, if you're having three meals a day, that's fine. Add a snack in there. If you're adding in snacks, just try to make sure they're a little bit more protein-based than fat-based. And honestly, when it comes down to that, some of those things are just that simple. I mean, if you don't have a highly active day, then don't consume a ton of carbs. You know, I mean, I don't want to get too too overly complex with this, but, uh, again, you know, if you have a consistent consistent regimen of exercise and it doesn't have to be you know highly intense if you make sure you're consuming enough uh you're enough liquids and then from there uh we have a little bit more protein based snacks rather than you know your sweets you're good and like i said with the liquids if you can you know try to base those liquids around water then you should be all right <clears throat> wow well Amazing stuff. That is healthy living, healthy lifestyles with Josh Gooding. Josh, I appreciate it. That That's the only insight that you'll find here on, the, on a Brave Hawk Talk. So thank you so much for your time, and uh, thanks for all you do here at UNCP. Absolutely, John. Again, thanks for having me, and look forward to uh, talking to you soon. Thanks so much for tuning in. A reminder, follow us on all of our social media platforms at UNCP underscore sports and also subscribe to our YouTube page. We'll be back next Wednesday. Have a great rest of your week, and remember to mask up.